Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Inside the Asperger Studios. Are you looking for a therapist who understands autism and ADHD? Well, my next guest is a neurodivergent therapist who's got a very deep full insight into it all because she is neurodivergent herself. So sit back, relax, and grab your favorite beverage, and I'll see you on the other side. See you there. I want to believe in the truth, but only see what I'm shown. Got the freedom to choose, but can't decide on my own. Follow what the group is thinking, bottle up my intuition till it's popping up. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Inside the Asperger Studios. Today, I'm joined with Carla Petronas. Welcome to the show, Carla. Thank you so much, Reed. It's Pretorius. It's really Pretorius. close to it's really close to Oscar Pistorius, but it's definitely not Oscar Pistorius's cousin or anything like that. I'm Carla Pretorius. <laughs> okay. So why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself, Carla? Sure, yes. Um, so I've been in the field of neurodiversity now for 20 plus years. It really is my life and my passion. Um, I was initially trained as a behavioral therapist and then supervisor, and then I branched out and collaborated with neurodivergent individuals in creating a holistic support system. Um, my academic background is psychology, so I have a master's in psychology. I'm actually starting my PhD hopefully this year. I just have to cram some Portuguese lessons because some of the classes are going to be in Portuguese. <laughs> Um, and other than that, I am neurodivergent. I was diagnosed with ADHD and anxiety in my 30s. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm just really happy to be here. I'm a therapist. I work with neurodivergent individuals. I work with families. Um, and I've got a tech company on the side, as you do being ADHD. <laughs> so let's talk about your services. Um, what do you offer your clients? So at the moment, I mean, it's quite a few different things. Um, I work personally, I work with neurodivergent adults. So I do sessions um, as a therapist with them. I love the combination of working as a counselor slash mentor. So it's providing them practical support strategies, but also giving them that space of, you know, I also go through these things. So not making them feel like this is, something that only them are are feeling or going through. So I really like that approach where it's lived experiences combined with the practical and the clinical side. So that's one thing that I offer. Um, Ames Global is one of my companies that I run. We still place therapists in the homes of families um, that I still do. And then we also created a um, an app called Tracto. Uh, for parents of neurodivergent kids, where they where the parents can track the child's mood, anxiety, anything else really, and their medication, um, and then also be provided with um, some videos of what to do in those trickier moments. That's everything I do. I mean, no, wait, there's one more. I work with Dan Jones, so I work with some of his clients, um, the mm -hmm. people that he sees from the Aspie world, and I provide support for parents and neurodivergent individuals. Now, uh, what is a, a session like when you deal with one of your clients? I mean, does it change from person to person? Does it change by age? Yeah, of course. That's a really good question, Reed. Um, I think personally, I mean, I'm a little bit biased um, as I am a therapist, but I believe that we all need to see a therapist. I think it's a space where you can just be yourself. I think a lot of neurodivergent individuals deal with trust issues. Um, and mm -hmm. if we speak with people, we often feel like we're a burden, um, whereas a therapist is there to support you, right? That's what you're mm -hmm. paying them for them to be. So I think it's nice to have that space where you can just open up and know that you're not being judged. So um, to answer your question, I would hope that my sessions make individuals feel like they're welcomed and they can just be themselves. Um, and then we find some strategies to support them in, in the challenges that they might have. So we speak about those. I, I usually relate. Um, I'm a very open therapist, so I share quite a lot of my personal life. Um, and then we find ways for them to to make it make it easier, um, understand why these things happen, 
Um, and then also to connect them with other individuals that are maybe going through the same thing. That's an important part of what I do offer. Um, I have some some groups. One of my groups is called the happiness group. We just share a happy photo every week with each other. And I feel like that combination of behavioral strategies, some behavioral strategies, a lot of mindfulness um, that I incorporate into sessions and suggestions, plus the feedback loop, positive feedback loop with the community is, is crucial for um, any form of progress. Now, how do you deal with a client who comes to you who says they have low self-esteem, low confidence. How do you help build that up so where they walk out feeling much better? Another great question. If you did your homework really well, because these are amazing questions. Um, I think with confidence, and it's also funny that you ask this because this is my um, PhD proposal, is how to increase confidence and decrease anxiety uh, for neurodivergent adults. And what I've realized is that we really need to focus a lot on different steps. The one, the first step is self-awareness. We need to understand ourselves, our own signs that we're feeling, starting to feel a little bit frustrated or um, irritated or overwhelmed a lot more. So that's that comes with self-awareness and then self-discovery. What does that mean for us? And then self-regulation, which is, you know, that goes with our sensory profile and our likes and our dislikes. And how can we regulate these things ourselves? What can what kind of sensory input can we do ourselves? We don't need it from somebody else to de-escalate and decompress. And then also to to start loving ourselves. I think that's a big one to increase confidence. And then later on, the last step that I feel is crucial in um, increasing confidence is uh, to focus on advocating for yourself. So I believe those steps, if we can work on those in every session, then I feel like we're winning. <laughs> I know. I mean, I've dealt with a friend who has low self-esteem and confidence, and he's I've had to almost troubleshoot his relationship with his him and his boyfriend to the point where his boyfriend had come to me saying he's imitating everything he does. He feels like he's got no identity. I'm like, let me talk to him. And I had to literally tell my friend, listen, you got to be your own self, number one. Number mm -hmm. two, you have to be happy with yourself before you're even before you even can contemplate be going any further in your relationship with him you gotta find things that make you happy you can't rely on him alone that puts mm -hmm. too much pressure on him so the, that's great advice um and i think it's so needed because a lot of us um we learn how to mask and we learn how to look at others and then copy copy and repeat you know control mm -hmm. control copy control v Control C, Control V, yeah. um, because we want to, we want to be liked, we want to fit in, and it makes total sense, and it it is actually a good way of learning that modeling behavior. But at some point, we need to say, okay, but I don't have to model things that I don't like, and I can do things and and be myself, and that's totally fine. You know, I was speaking to a client yesterday and she was telling me, she's like, I, I just need to stop stimming in public. And I was like, okay, but, you know, let's look at that because you're putting so much pressure and expectations on yourself for stopping something that you obviously need. You need to regulate. That's your body regulating. And of course we can do, you know, I'm stimming as we're sitting here with this piece of, um, in South Africa, we call this press stick where, um, I don't know, what a tiki-tack or something in America. But we need certain things, and our body, bodies are always going to need these things. But if we tell ourselves that we need to stop this, that's mm -hmm. putting added, that's that's just added pressure. So I think, I believe that if, we, if we're okay with who we are, that's the biggest first step. And then we can start regulating in ways, you know, in certain ways, we want to make it a little bit less conspicuous. So things like... Tiki tack. <laughs> I don't know what's this called. What is this called, Reed? Um, I'm trying to find I, I Tiki Tack. It's it's tick tack or tack tick or something, right? I mean, in America. I remember when I was in school in uh England, 
they said you can uh, you can that's what they wanted us to use the hanger poster so we don't ruin the walls because it comes off easily Yes, exactly. So that's what it is, but I don't know what it's called. In South Africa, it's called Price Stick because it's the brand that we use, but I don't know. Anyways, the point is we all have our things. We're all different, and I think we should just embrace it. And I know it's easier said than done, but if you have a cheerleader, like I would I would say that I'm a lot of my clients as cheerleader. I, I really am an advocate for them. I feel like if we have somebody in our corner, it makes it easier. So it doesn't need necessarily need to be a therapist, especially if you can't afford a therapist, but it needs to be somebody that believes in you and loves you for exactly who you are. And then we can start believing it and actually do it ourselves, hopefully. I mean, I think the biggest problem is we are so used to people pleasing that we, Mm. we are afraid of hurting somebody by, by, by doing something else instead of copying what they're doing and we just want to please that we're just we're so used to it it just becomes natural for us yeah that's a good point and and that's something else that we do in therapy a lot is to work on that assertiveness and to say okay you know we're not gonna i think there's a a bit of a if we're not people pleasing then are we being rude kind of thing that a mm-hmm. lot of us go through and there's a big um, middle ground there it doesn't necessarily need to go from one extreme to the other right um, so we can also say that if we are not people pleasing and we're standing up for ourselves we're being a little bit more assertive that is that's not being rude that's not being selfish um, and I think if we start seeing okay the gray area in between is where we want to aim towards that that helps us quite a bit too now how do you deal with clients who have like anxiety who afraid to travel or afraid to do this or afraid to step out of their house how do you deal with that anxiety to the fact to the point where they're more comfortable with they're okay with going places they're okay that the world's not gonna crumble the minute they step outside of their house yeah, I mean, um, a lot, if not all of my clients um, are dealing with an excess amount of anxiety. Um, and I think I might have mentioned in the beginning that I was you know, diagnosed with ADHD and anxiety. I don't know mm-hmm. if I mentioned the anxiety part, but anxiety is part of us. I think the first step is to recognize that it's not a bad thing. Um, you know, again, coming from South Africa, it's probably have saved me quite a bit um, in dangerous situations, my level of anxiety, because I'm always aware of what is going on. Um, I do think, though, that we can take the power back and say, well, anxiety is here. It's not a bad thing. It does help me, but I can also manage it myself. I'm in control of this. Um, and I, I focus a lot on mindfulness activities. So I'm a firm believer of meditating, going for walks, um, breath work, doing Pilates, uh, you know, like exercises that help you stay present and know that you're in control of your breathing. Um, you mentioned aviophobia. So I've got a client that is really that is quite scared to fly. Um, that's got a phobia for it and we worked on a few different techniques so it depends on their level of anxiety if it is an actual phobia I would say that you should speak to a therapist that is quite well versed in um, the different strategies and not just google it but if it is anxiety I would say that the first step would be to definitely make sure that you're including mindfulness every day. It doesn't necessarily need to be 30 minutes of meditation because I feel like that wouldn't work for any ADHD -er. but it can just be like, I'm going to mindfully eat the snack. I'm going to see what, what ingredients do I taste? Like, is it a little bit different than the snack that I had yesterday? And what do I taste? Like what things can I spot? so that we can just become more aware of the present moment and not worry so much about the future or the past. Mm -hmm. How do you, now, how many clients are ADHD and to how many clients are autistic that do you see? Um, So I would say my statistics is, it's probably about 
60-40, um, 60 ADHDer, 60% ADHDers and 40% autistic, but there's an overlap too. So mm -hmm. it's very difficult. So like if they were diagnosed with ADHD first and then autism or the other way around. Um, so a lot of my clients are showing both uh, signs for, or, you know, like the signs for both, um, or they were actually diagnosed with both. So it's very it's very, it's equal, I think I would say, and I work. Funnily enough, I work with them quite quite similarly to my clients that that are diagnosed with autism and ADHD. We have very similar traits. Um, I feel like we. Uh, this is maybe a personal opinion, so I wouldn't say that this is a professional opinion. But a, my personal opinion is, I feel like we make really good friends, ADHDers and uh, people on the spectrum. I think that we help each other in different ways. My my partner is on the spectrum and he helps me very much to be a little bit more systematic, whereas I'm probably supporting him to be a bit more spontaneous. <laughs> so I think that it's good for partners and friendships to mix. Yeah, sorry. I don't I don't know. That wasn't really part of your question, but <laughs> no, that's all right. Now, what do you see some of the biggest struggles are that your clients come in with? Anxiety, for sure. That's one of them. Um, relationships. I would say that uh, interpersonal relationships, relationships with family members, that is a big one that that we often speak about. Um, anxiety goes with con levels of confidence. And then also, if I'm thinking more to, to my clients that are more diagnosed with autism, I would say, or my t autistic clients, I would say um, workplace um, challenges. So relationships with co-workers, um, relationships with employers, and kind of the accommodations in the employment. Now, when you deal with the autistic clients with relationships, how do you go about that? I mean, I, we know that's one of the toughest things we deal with is relationships, finding that certain someone. What What are some of the ways you work with them on that? So um, if it is somebody that is seeking a relationship, I would probably work on them to uh, that first part again that I mentioned earlier of the self-awareness. So I would ask them, let's work on your sensory profile. Let's work on your likes and dislikes. What do you want in a relationship? What do you? What are your non-negotiables? It's very similar to working with any person. We want to find out who they are what they really want from a relationship and making sure that they go towards people that are going to provide that, right? Because if if we're saying that, oh, I want a certain type of person and or I want somebody that's not very social and we're looking for that person in a bar, that's probably not going to be the person that we're mm -hmm. wanting to be with because they are probably more social if, if we're meeting them at a bar. And same example, if my client is sensory sensitive, I wouldn't ask them to go and meet people at bars. Um, so it really depends on my client's profile and then what they seek in a relationship. But it really is, it's a lot of self-exploration um, and, and working on levels of confidence before we speak about the actual dates. We, we really work on ourselves. Yeah. Now you mentioned that you help them with like work work situations. Do you intervene in the way where you talk with the employer and try to get them to understand what's going on with the client that they are neurodivergent that they need these things to help them work better? Yes, definitely. So I do quite a lot of workshops with um, employers, uh, with companies where I would speak about accommodations in the workplace. And I would often show them that it really is, it's quite easy to include these accommodations and that they will most definitely help everyone involved, not just neurodivergent individuals. So, you know, some of these accommodations would be to um, make sure that you provide an instruction in multiple ways. So not just, um, not just saying what you want from the person, but also putting it in writing. So making sure that there are two ways of communication always, that the rules are clearly stated, um, that we understand what is expected of us, that we're not saying work until you want to 
for example, you know, you need to be quite specific, specific language is used, um, and that we're not expecting too much if it becomes, if it's something that somebody volunteers, like, for example, if it is a, a special interest of one of my clients to work on coding, they'll be able to do that on a Friday evening until like 9 p.m. But we really want to make sure that the employers are also aware that our clients could go from zero to 100 or from working and enjoying it to burnout really quickly. Mm -hmm. So they need to be aware of, of people volunteering and doing too much too and sticking with the rules, really. There are so many little things that we can change, the lighting, the, the way mm -hmm. that we place our people in work environments. That's interesting you mentioned that because I had recently talked with the Assistant Minister of Autism in Australia, and she had yeah. said they had did that with one of their grocery stores where they talked with them and they got them to cut the lights half off and get rid of the beeping sounds from the cashier so their people can work better and, and feel comfortable. And she says, because of that, it is increased their level of business. Nice. That's awesome. And it makes so much sense, right? If you think about it, like that would be so annoying to me if I had to sit and hear the beep every mm -hmm. time. Um, the, the flip side of that is when the beep becomes really fun and it becomes something that we want to do over and over and then probably scanning an object too many times. I did that the other day in a shop <laughs> where I was like, Drut, like it was a really nice sound. It was like, Drut, and I went, Drut. And then I had to call the security lady because I was like, oopsie, I scanned this three times. <laughs> now, you mentioned a very important topic, and that is burnout. How do you deal with clients who, are, who have gone through it? How do you help them climb out of it? And how do you help them make sure they don't wind up in that same hole again? Mm, it's a difficult question to answer, right? Because burnout is uh, quite severe. So if my client has already gone through a burnout or if they're in a burnout at the moment, um, we go really slow and we try to decrease all expectations and responsibilities really and just keep it to the bare minimum um, and then slowly start habit stacking. So which is like we start with one good habit, like getting up and drinking a glass of water and then creating a stacking approach where we'll be like, okay, if that becomes a habit after a couple of weeks, then we'll start adding one more thing. Okay, now a glass of water and going for a walk. And we're trying to create a healthy routine again um, for them so that they can see, okay, once I get into a routine, I can slot in some work again that is good for me. So it can't be the same job that led them to burnout or it needs to, the approach at work needs to be different. So either there needs to be some education, um, educating done at work again with the managers because something led, led them to burnout, right? So we need to change what is happening at work. Um, and then to really, again, focus on re recognizing those smaller um signs those initial signs of okay i need to stick to my routine until five i work and then i'm off then i close my laptop i exit the working environment because this is now my working space so once i'm finished with work today i need to close my laptop i need to exit this this room and i need to go do something that decompresses me so that I don't think of work all the time. So if I take my laptop downstairs now, I'll probably be still thinking about work. Mm -hmm. So we need to create those systems. It's quite, you know, it's, I mean, it's not that many, but slowly but surely we need to create a way for all of us and definitely the clients that I work with to be able to manage it themselves. Um, because ideally that's what you want. You don't, you don't want to see a therapist the whole time. You want to be able to to manage it yourself. So you've taught them also to spot the signs of what what's leading up to burnout. I'm working too much. I'm 
taking on too many hours. I'm feeling tired and irritable. These are signs of burnout. You need to step back. Exactly. Yeah. So we definitely need to have those signs, but also not just the signs, but then what to do when we're feeling like that. Is it that we need to um, take a long weekend or do we need to look at if we have any hobbies in place? Do we need to see our close friends or some quiet time maybe, or, you know, something needs to change. So that's where the self-regulation again comes in, which is really important. Now, do you also help them, like, if they want to find employment, like if they want to figure out what kind of job fits them or suits them? Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, that's one of my favorite topics, actually. Um, and that that again is like going through like we can either do a few assessments and see like screening tools to see like if this person likes more um, which which kind of fields this person likes and then to visualize going into those offices or into that field what it first of all what it would take what what are the prerequisites is it studying or is it just going in and getting some experience and then finding a mentor within that job. Um, field mm -hmm. it, or the career is important to find somebody that can just show them around um, and or introduce them to the different parts of the working environment. Um, if I am in person, I would go with them. Otherwise, I would find a mentor for them to go and see and and ex and gain some experience. That that really is important because sometimes in our minds it could be the ideal work environment until we get there and the machinery are, is really loud or mm -hmm. you know there's like a hundred people in an open office which is a nightmare <laughs> so, for I think any neurodivergent individual. Now have you had have you had clients who say I would want to work from home as opposed to work from an office how do you help them choose what fits them what suits them where to go what's better for them because you and I both know we are better off, some of us are better off working from home on, and some of us are better off in the place where you can socialize, where you can make newer friends and colleagues. And so how do you help them decide what fits them? I think it's important to um, speak to them and ask them what, what they prefer. I think um, COVID has given us the opportunity to see if we do like remote working because everybody had to work remotely. So I think that was nice. Um, and personally, I love working remotely, but a lot of my clients would say that, I mean, you know, it's, it's also a bit of a mix, but a lot of my clients would say that they like the hybrid opportunity at least mm -hmm. to be able to go into work to, to see some people. Otherwise they feel like they're not seeing anyone. Um, but it really, it's it's quite a personal choice. So I, I would speak to them and ask them and see if they have other opportunities to socialize because it is important to socialize. I say this very hypocritically because I don't socialize a lot. I just work. Uh, but um, but I think it is important to see what, what are their interests and then to figure out, to answer the second part of your question there, to figure out what environment would work best for them is it's really important to know what their sensory profile and needs are. And then we can make slight adjustments and accommod and in include accommodations, but it really is important to find the perfect environment with nice people around in the work environment. So again, I would probably do a bit of visualization, but then also go and explore the actual environments if they wanna go out and not just do hybrid or not just do remote work, sorry. Now, do you check up on your clients when you've got that, when they have found a job, do you like check in on them and ask them how they're doing? Are they happy where they are? And if they're yes. not happy, where do you go from that point? So, yes, of course, I stay in touch with all my clients. Um, if they are not happy, I would see if it is something that we can support with. So if, if I can support them with, so if I can speak to the employer or the colleagues perhaps, or if they want me to, or if it's something that we can work together on. Um, if it is something that they really do want to change, then I will support them in finding something else. Okay. Now, 
you mentioned you have ADHD. When you were diagnosed, did that change your world in any? Did that like open up your eyes and make you think, oh, wow, this explains why I am the way I am? Yeah, so my diagnosis, it actually happened um, twice before the formal diagnosis. My my therapist told me um, once in a session, he said, oh, but you can do all these things because of your ADHD. And I was like, because of what now? I didn't, <laughs> you know, I, I wasn't aware of that. And um, the, the, the second one was actually really funny. I was in Hong Kong working um, as the director for AIMS Global. So I was spreading the word of that. Um, of AIMS Global that we have this therapy or a therapist available to work with the children in their homes and I was speaking to a pediatrician in Hong Kong and he paused and he said look can I just give this to you and it was a pamphlet of um, subtle signs of ADHD in females <laughs> <laughs> I was like oh thanks <laughs> Can I continue giving you my pitch now? This is basically what I was thinking. But then I went to get a proper diagnosis. And yes, to answer your question, I think it did change my my world a little bit because I felt um, validated. I felt mm -hmm. like, okay, I am allowed to be distracted. You know, now I understand why I'm so anxious before things, uh, why details matter so much to me why I get bored um, for from a lot of chit chat and I would love to speak about autism and ADHD for the rest of my life but the rest of the topics really don't interest me <laughs> <laughs> you know things like that and it did um, I also knew why I got so overwhelmed in shopping centers you know the sensory profile was mm. a was an eye-opener for me um, I think it when you get a diagnosis, um, and this is true for a lot of my clients, you feel a sense of relief. Well, I did at least, and most of my clients did, but there is a bit of a backlash afterwards where you're like, okay, well, right. So what do I do now? And I would love to tell people in that moment that there is support. There are a lot of people that are also going through this. Um, mm -hmm. People like yourself are, putting out a lot of educational videos that they can watch. You know, um, there are a lot of other advocates out there to, to, to listen to and learn from. I would highly recommend people listening to podcasts like yours mm -hmm. um, and to others like Dan Jones, the mm -hmm. SB world, because it really helps you understand that you're not alone. And I think that's the first step in all of this, that you're not you're not quirky. You're all, you you can be quirky for sure, but you're not weird. <laughs> you're, you're just different, and it's cool. Now, do you feel that your diagnosis gives you more of a connection to your clients? I definitely think so. Yes. Um. And ever since my official diagnosis, ever since I stated it to my clients, I feel like, and I might be wrong, but I feel like they're also really relaxed to see a mm -hmm. therapist. Uh, because in the past, maybe they were didn't want to open up as quickly. And if I say, oh, this is what I do when I feel like that, or when I go through this situation, I feel like they they get it. I was working, um, this, this, is, this relates quite well with this, but I was working for a little while with, um, with um, individuals with drug addiction. And the one person asked me once, he's like, he was a heroin addict. And he asked me, have you ever done heroin? And I said, no, I haven't. And he said, well, why are you talking to me? You have no idea how good it is. <laughs> and and I think that's, that's a, quite a true statement. It's like, you know, if you're going through anxiety, being neurodivergent, a neurotypical therapist is going to struggle to understand why it is so intense, mm -hmm. why these feelings take over you know, why we can pass out because of anxiety. So I think neurodivergent um, therapists, I believe it's easier to talk to them, but, you know, I'm biased. So. <laughs> I mean, that's why when my mom, after my father had died, my mom wanted me to talk to somebody. And I was hesitant until a little thing clicked in my head and said, if I'm going to talk to somebody, it's got to be someone that understands autism. So that's when mm. I did my research and started looking for someone. 
and then I found my co my life coach, and then everything just started to fall into place because they understood what I'm dealing with, how I'm dealing with it, and how my life relates with everything else. Mm, I'm so sorry about your dad. I'm I'm in the same club. I I do mm. miss my dad a lot. It's uh it's not the best club to be in. I'm sorry, Reed. Thanks. Anyway. How can people find out more about you online? Um, so I'm actually revamping my personal website, so they won't be able to find me there, but they'll they can go to aimsglobal.info. Um, or they could just send me an email. I mean, I'm I'm pretty open with that. So it's my name, which is Carla with a K, Carla at aimsglobal.info. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm here and I would love to chat with whoever. Um, I really love what I do and I think that's that's quite important for us to find something that we're passionate about. And that's it, everyone. I'm Reed Miles, and that was Carla, and I'll see you in the next one. See you there, everybody. Bye bye.